Um, I would like now to introduce our, the Cure PSP medical director. Uh, we pay him a huge salary. <laughs> By the way, he is a volunteer. Uh, but our Director of uh, Research and Clinical Affairs for Cure PSP, I, you've got Dr. Golby's uh, review here, so I don't want to go over all his details because I want you to hear him, but I do want to let you know that he is a Professor of Neurology at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Phenomenal guy, and he knows PSP. He's going to talk about PSP, and then after that, Yvette uh, Bordelon, who I'll interview introduced to you uh, in a minute. We'll be, after that, we'll be uh, talking about MSA and CBD. So hang on for the ride. And th let, me, let me just say one thing. There's a lot of overlap in these diseases. And um, like I said, my husband was diagnosed with PSP and then had CBD. So even if they're talking about a disease you haven't been diagnosed with, listen, because it, there's a lot you can pick up uh, about these as you see kind of how they intertwine. Dr. Golby. Thank you, Janet, for the introduction. And thank you, Pat. I hope I can live up to your billing. Um, let me see if I can throw this up on the screen. Uh, something's happening. OK. Um, you saw the, uh, you saw Pat's slide that said, uh, and Richard's slide, and Janet's slide that said, uh, because hope matters. Um, you know, I kind of didn't realize that until a few years ago. Um, you know, I came into this job as the uh, research and clinical director of this organization thinking that, oh, you know, all we need to do is apply hard, cold science to the problem, and that'll be it. That'll be enough. And... Uh, it turns out that's not true. There's, there's an awful lot that, that depends on people's emotional expectations. And uh, I kind of came to slowly understand that. And that has really helped me in, uh, in dealing with the needs of my patients and the, uh, the needs of the whole research program of Cure PSP. So what I'm going to talk to you about right now is a little bit about what we understand about PSP's biological basis and, um, and its treatment. So, first of all, the obligatory declaration of where I get research support and the declaration that yes, I will be discussing drugs that the FDA has not approved for PSP. Of course, they haven't approved any drugs for PSP. Uh, the most famous celebrity, with the possible exception of Pat Richardson's uh, dad, um, to have PSP, uh, Dudley Moore. Now, uh, Janet gave you a little bit of a flavor of the, the spectrum of diseases that we're talking about here. I want to put PSP into that, uh, into that spectrum a little bit for you. You're all probably familiar with Parkinson's disease, a lot of slowness, stiffness, the marquee feature, I hope I'm not being disrespectful by calling it a marquee feature, uh, is tremor for Parkinson's disease. These other conditions, uh, except for uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, don't have much tremor. They tend to, uh, to be mainly stiffness and slowness. So all of these conditions have stiffness and slowness. We call that Parkinsonism. Uh, but they differ in some very important details. For example, PSP, the marquee feature of PSP is brainstem problems. The brainstem is the part of the brain at the bottom that connects the main cerebrum to the spinal cord. And the brainstem is not just a, a passive connector. There's loads of circuitry packed in there. And in particular, the circuits that serve the functions on our head and neck, our, our vision, uh, speech, uh, swallowing, that sort of hearing, that sort of thing. Uh, 
uh, although hearing's not effective in PSP, but many of those other brain stem functions are, and that is the most important thing that distinguishes PSP from these other conditions. Uh, corticobasal degeneration, as Yvette will tell you, is marked by asymmetry, where one side of the body remains much worse than the other side through most of the course of the illness in most patients, and apraxia, which is a, a loss of, a, of ability to do complicated things with your hands um, or your feet. That is not much of a feature in these other conditions. MSA, multiple system atrophy, the cardinal features of that, the marquee features, are dysautonomia, which means things like low blood pressure, bladder problems, constipation, heat intolerance, uh, sleep regulation, even the uh, functions of constriction of the pupil can be affected with MSA. Uh, and also ataxia, which means a cerebellar problem, a problem coordination and with coordination that when it's impaired, it looks like you're drunk, this kind of wavering uh, gross uh, inability to direct movements or control movements, that's, uh, that's called ataxia, and that's the cardinal feature of MSA. You don't get much of that in any of these other conditions. Then there's this condition called dementia with Lewy bodies, which is like Parkinson's disease, but spread over more of the brain. It emphasizes the thinking part of the brain rather than the moving part of the brain, and hallucinations and other cognitive mental problems are the hallmark of that. And then there's frontotemporal dementia, which is also mostly a behavioral type of thing where there's a lot of disinhibition. You certainly get disinhibition with all of these conditions to an extent, but it's uh, much more important with frontotemporal dementia. Now, getting down to the microscopic level, all of the neurodegenerative diseases, as we've discovered only in the past uh, 20 years or so, all of the neurodegenerative diseases have some kind of protein that aggregates, that gloms up in the brain cells. Now the protein in every case is some normal protein that has some normal job to do in the brain. It's just that it forms these clumps. And we don't know if the clumps are just a result of the damage, the brain cell's normal reaction to it, or if the clumps are actually causing problems. But in the case of PSP, the protein that's clumping up is tau. And in the case of Parkinson's, it's alpha-synuclein. And uh, these other conditions have either tau or alpha-synuclein, but there are other neurodegenerative diseases that aren't similar to PSP that have, other, uh, that have yet other proteins that clump up. For example, in Lou Gehrig disease, it's a different protein. In Alzheimer's disease, tau is one protein that clumps, and there's a different one called beta amyloid that also clumps. And I could go through a long list and put you all to sleep of other diseases where it's different kinds of proteins. Now there are, I, I want you to understand what a non-degenerative Parkinsonism is. That's one where you don't have loss of brain cells. Uh, it can be, these things can be mistaken for PSP sometimes, particularly vascular Parkinsonism, which is caused by multiple small strokes Neuroleptic-induced Parkinsonism, which is the result of certain drugs used in psychiatry, reversible when the drug is stopped, and normal pressure hydrocephalus, which is where there's a blockage of circulation of the spinal fluid in the brain. So here's a, here's a table showing those things. Um, first of all, on the right is what the normal brain looks like on an MRI scan. Uh, the neuroleptic Parkinsonism, the drug-induced one, does not change the appearance of the brain on the MRI. But on the left, you see vascular Parkinsonism. All these little, move, these little um, dots there in the basal ganglia, that's the part of the brain that's involved with PSP. In vascular Parkinsonism, you have little strokes there. And that's what those little dots are that you see. And then in normal pressure hydrocephalus, you don't have any dots, but you've got ballooning up of those fluid-filled spaces inside the brain. And you can uh, fix that with a drain. It's called a shunt. Now, this gets complicated. Um, I, I don't expect anyone to um, remember all this, much less be able to read it from the back of the room. 
But this shows how PSP and CBD are not cut and dried diseases. There is a lot of sloppiness around the edges. People who look like they have PSP might have CBD, actually, or other things. People who, whose brains at autopsy show PSP, maybe during life, they, look like, they might have looked like they had some other disease. This makes it very difficult to do research on these diseases, as you might imagine. So for the, um, the pink rectangles here are the clinical pictures, in other words, the outward appearance during life of how of different diseases. And the blue and the green and the purple are the appearance through the microscope of the brain. And you can see that there is far from a one-to-one a -one correlation. There's just all sorts of overlaps and misalignments here. And this is something that is really slowing down research. So here's what PSP looks like through the microscope. These black things are those blobs of tau protein that I mentioned, neurofibrillary tangles. And this is a blob of tau protein and a different kind of brain cell. These are all in neurons, the, the electrically active brain cells. And this one is in an astrocyte, which is a, a, an important kind of brain cell, but it's not electrically active. It's traditionally been thought to just play a supporting role to kind of nourish and protect the electrically active cells. The last few years, though, there's been some evidence that these glia, as they're called, the glial cells, really do a lot more than that. They may function in, even in memory and learning and all sorts of very complicated things. So uh, that's still a book yet to be written, what the glia are doing. But PSP actually seems to start in those electrically non-active cells in the glia. The problem probably starts there and then spreads to the neurons, to the electrically active cells later. And that is not true of most of the other neurodegenerative diseases. All right, now genetics. Um, PSP is not a hereditary condition. I mean, you have to look really hard to find somebody with PSP who has someone in their family with proven PSP. Nevertheless, there is a variant in the tau gene that is present in nearly everybody with PSP. Actually, this is the chromosomes, not people. Each person has two chromosomes, one from your two chromosomes of each number, one from your mother, one from your father. Uh, so if you count chromosomes, 94% of the chromosomes in people, of the chromosome 17s in people with PSP have this H1 haplotype, it's called, an H1 flavor. But that's true of only 77% of controls of people who don't have PSP. Now, it may not seem like a huge difference, but actually this is a pretty important difference. And this is, this is for real. This has been confirmed many times, many places. And if you actually look at people, where each person has two chromosome 17s, then it's 81 and 60. Now, the, this variant, we call it a variant, but actually, it's, as you've seen, it's present in the majority of people. But it's not quite uniformly spread over the world. You can see that here in Europe, uh, something like a quarter of the population has the H2. And in most of the rest of the world, pretty much everybody has the H1. And yet PSP seems to be just as common as, as far as we can tell by informal observation. It seems to be equally common all over the world. So this is not a huge influence on the cause of PSP but it's enough of an influence that it's useful in trying to find the cause. So what are the conclusions about H1 haplotype in PSP and CBD? It's uh, nearly necessary, but far from sufficient for PSP or CBD to develop. If you have one chromosome 17 with the H2 haplotype, you reduce your PSP risk. You don't eliminate it. You almost eliminate it. If you have both chromosome 17s, you almost eliminated even more. 
And uh, it looks like the H2 haplotype arose in an ancestor of most of the modern European Caucasian population, which is why those pie charts from Europe showed about a quarter having the H2. The rest of the world seems to have almost all H1. All right, so if H1 is not the whole explanation, what is? Well, to answer that question, CurePSP undertook to do a state-of-the-art whole genome analysis, it's called WGA, a few years ago. And we, um, we asked this guy, Jerry Schellenberg, who's at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, world-class geneticist, to convene a group, and here's the group, to, uh, to study this. So they all combined uh, DNA samples from their brain collections, and our, our brain collection at, at our Cure PSP Brain Bank was by far the largest contributor. And long story short, here's the result. Uh, we found novel signals, this is, this is science, science ease, for um, new genes that weren't previously suspected of being related to PSP, a novel signal associated with PSP risk in these three genes. And none of these three were previously associated with PSP or anything else. And we confirmed two independent variants in the tau gene. So not only is there that H1, which we already knew about before this study, but we found another mutation in the tau gene that's not related to the H1 problem, which independently adds a little bit to one's risk of getting PSP. Now each of these other three, these, these three new ones, they, each of them adds a little bit of risk, but even when you add them all together, it still doesn't explain all of the risk of getting PSP. So what does? Well, let's dissect a brain cell, shall we? Let's look at what goes on in the brain cell that might allow this protein to build up in a misfolded, misshapen way and cause mischief. Well, this is the cell's garbage disposal. It's called the proteasome, and it's really, it's kind of a barrel-shaped cluster of proteins, very complicated structure. On the right, it's what it looks like if you look down the bore of the garbage disposal, like when you look down your sink, the drain of your sink. And the, um, the misfolded proteins go in the top and they get chopped up and they come out the bottom, just like a garbage disposal. And there's some evidence that this thing is not working right in people with neurodegenerative diseases. What else might be causing, might be contributing? Well, there, is, uh, there have been very few studies of environmental influences. You'd think, all right, it seems not to be a familial disease, so let's look for some environmental cause. Well, there's been only two studies that have looked at that, actually three. I've done two of them, and one was just kind of a repeat of the other to confirm. Uh, the other one was done in France by this guy named Vidal. And what both studies showed is that people with PSP report having a little bit less education than control people, than people from the same community, same demographics pretty much, uh, but who don't have PSP. It's not a huge difference. The odds ratio you see here is, is 0.38, but that's a pretty respectable odds ratio for a, for a study of this sort. So why might lesser education contribute to the cause of PSP? Well, here are some theories that I've listed here. I have no particular evidence for any of these. More occupational exposure to some toxin. People with less education are more likely to work in factories, um, more likely to have jobs that might expose them to toxins. Maybe they live on the part of town where there are more likely to be factories. So even if, even if it's uh, not a person who works in a toxic environment, maybe just living in that area might do the trick. Difference in diet. If you have less education, you tend to be less wealthy, and less wealthy people tend to have less, just for sociological reasons, I don't understand, tend to have a different kind of diet. And less synaptic reserve. Now, this is interesting. When you get an education, 
you actually build up more connections in your brain, more synapses, to handle all that information and to handle the more complicated ways of thinking that educated people typically, not always, are trained to do. And then decades later, some neurodegenerative disease comes along and there's more of a buffer, there's more of a reserve there so that the damage that the disease does takes longer to appear, takes longer to manifest itself outwardly. And that could lead to the result in this survey. Now there's another, um, on the topic of a dietary cause of PSP, there is some, some evidence from two islands on opposite sides of the world, two tropical islands, one's in the Caribbean, Guadeloupe, and the other is in the Pacific, Guam. On both islands, there is far more uh, of a PSP-like illness. It's not quite PSP. It differs in some important details at the level of the molecules, but it, it's a tau disorder in both cases. And uh, in neither case does it seem to be just uh, running in families, like you might expect some geographical isolated disease to do sometimes. Uh, it seems to be something environmental, and we haven't yet figured it out. Although, in Guadeloupe, the people there who have that disease report having consumed more of these fruits, sweet sop and sour sop, than people who don't have the disease. And when scientists went and extracted chemicals from these fruits, they found that when they injected the, one of these chemicals into mice, that the mice developed tau aggregates in their brains. So, tau aggregates. What, how is the aggregate spreading through the brain? That's a big question. If we can interrupt that, that would be excellent if we could have a test that would detect it when it first affects one little part of the brain and then stop it at that point, holy cow, that would be almost like a cure for PSP. So there's this new theory as to how this happens. And the point of trying to figure out why it happens is that we can identify new drug targets. By that I mean steps in the biochemistry, chemical reactions that are taking place in the brain cells where you might be able to interrupt the process with a drug. That's how most drugs work. They interrupt some kind of a chemical reaction. They slow it down. They, they throw a monkey wrench into it. So here in this still hypothetical model are many, many drug targets where maybe drugs can be developed. And here's how the model works. Up on the upper left, that straight line is supposed to represent a normal tau molecule. Actually, the normal tau molecule isn't a straight thing. It looks like a piece of spaghetti in a pot of boiling water. It just has no particular shape. But then it folds into a rigid shape. That's not what it's supposed to do. And when that happens, that proteasome, that garbage disposal, is supposed to get rid of it. But if there's too much of it, then it overwhelms the proteasome, or if the proteasome's not working right for some reason, then you get too many of these abnormally folded tau molecules, and they tend to clump up into these tight uh, uh, mini clumps, and then the mini clumps form these maxi clumps, neurofibrillary tangles. The mini clumps seem to be the toxic one. That's, that's what causes the mischief, it looks like, it causes the cell damage. Now, here's the interesting part. When the, the abnormal, abnormally folded tau molecule, according to this new theory, seems to make the normally folded tau ones misfold abnormally in a chain reaction. And that can spread through the cell, and then the cell dies and breaks and, uh, and releases the abnormally folded tau molecules into the general neighborhood, and they can get taken up by other brain cells where they induce this process all over again. It's a vicious cycle and it spreads. And that may very well be how these diseases, not only PSP and CBD, but all of the neurodegenerative diseases spread from one part of the brain to another. And this is a very 
ripe opportunity to interrupt the process. So here's a, a model of how this might happen. You've got, here's time, decades, person's life, and here is tau aggregation, clumping up of tau. And here is this horizontal line is uh, just kind of a random line I drew to indicate the point at which that vicious cycle gets going, at the point at which the trigger is pulled and there's now an irreversible spread through the brain of abnormally folded tau. Well, up until uh, uh, midlife sometime, late life, there's this just random uh, aggregation of tau and it gets taken care of by the proteasome and by other garbage disposal functions in the cell. But that process gets more and more difficult as you age, just like everything else as you age, and eventually a random blip pulls that trigger. And at that point, the process really takes off. So that is the, that's where a lot of our research now is headed, trying to take advantage of that new model to identify new drugs to interrupt the process. But meanwhile, we still have to treat people with PSP. So the rest of my talk will be about ways we do that right now. Levodopa, which is the active ingredient in Cinemet, carb along with uh, Carbidopa. The Carbidopa just prevents nausea that you would get if you took Levodopa alone. Levodopa helps a little bit in a minority of people, and it's worth trying in most people with PSP. It mainly helps the, uh, the stiffness and the, the walking. Stiffness and the walking. <clears throat> a lot of the important symptoms of PSP would not be helped by levodopa. Fortunately, people with PSP are much more resistant to the, to the uh, side effects of levodopa that people with Parkinson's get. You've seen Michael J. Fox with his involuntary movements. That's a side effect of his levodopa. That side effect is very, very rare and mild in PSP. Uh, this just shows uh, a retrospective tallying of my own patient's results with levodopa. Very modest benefit. Amantadine. This is an old-time Parkinson drug. It's been around as long as levodopa. It, it came on the market about the same time as levodopa, but it was show, so overshadowed by the benefit of levodopa that it never really got much traction. But it still has some really uh, useful properties and is still used in Parkinson's. It turns out that in PSP, it can help even when levodopa fails, sometimes. Not, not in a majority of people, but in enough people that it's worth trying. And a lot of doctors aren't aware of this. Antidepressants can help some aspects of PSP as well. There's depression in PSP and CBD, and uh, antidepressants can help. There's no controlled trials. I mean, there's barely any controlled trials of, of antidepressants in Parkinson's, uh, where depression is definitely a major problem. Uh, and in PSP, there have been no controlled trials. And even anecdotal data, you know, a case or two or three at a time with no, no controls, even those are hard to find. Now, the pseudobulbar affect, that's, pseudobulbar affect means uh, inappropriate laughing or crying when it's not really appropriate. Uh, other types of disinhibited behavior there's anecdotal data that antidepressants can help that. And this is not just a kind of a harmless uh, annoyance because sometimes people with PSP or CBD, they will just be so disinhibited in their behavior that they will stand up from their chair and try to walk when they see something that interests them across the room, even though they know that they don't have the necessary balance to do that and they fall, and it's, uh, it's a big cause of complications. And then when you ask them, did you realize that your balance was not gonna be adequate to do that? They say, yeah, I knew that, I just couldn't, couldn't resist. It's called the rocket sign, and it's worth trying antidepressants for that. The cholinesterase inhibitors, these are, these are drugs like Aricept and uh, Exelon, Razadine, uh, 
that are used in, um, in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, in PSP and CBD, the psychological problems are very different from Alzheimer's, but still, it's worth a shot. And Namenda, which is commonly used in Alzheimer's as well, uh, has never been tested in PSP, and in most of the experts' experience, doesn't really help and causes all sorts of side effects, so I don't bother with it. There have been some experimental drugs for PSP. Uh, this is kind of a sad story. The top four of these were all, they all work in animal models. In other words, you take a mouse, you put in an abnormal gene for tau, or an extra gene for tau, and the mouse gets those tangles in its brain, and it starts to lose brain cells, and starts to walk funny and behave funny. And you give these drugs, and that prevents the process. Give any of these drugs, it prevents the process to some extent, in some way. None of them, none of them panned out in the human trials. Now, this coenzyme Q10, there's still a trial going on uh, that's headquartered at the Leahy Clinic, just a few miles from here. Uh, the result of that will be available later this year. A few years ago, there was this trial in 2008, just a small number of patients, 21, but it did show a benefit, a modest benefit. And this shows the, uh, the extent of that benefit. This uses uh, the, <clears throat> the PSP the PSP rating scale, which is, uh, takes about 10 minutes for the doctor to do. Most neurologists haven't heard of this, but they should. Uh, I'm, conflict of interest here, I invented this. <laughs> Published it. Sometimes called the Golby scale, not that I'm the instigator of that. But anyway, uh, it's, been, it's used all over the world now. It's the standard scale that's used in drug trials. Uh, anyway, in this drug trial, the people who were uh, getting the coenzyme Q10 had about one point of improvement on average out of the 100 points in the scale. The patient started out with a score of about 40, with zero being normal, 100 being the worst possible score. Their, their average score at the beginning was about 40, so they improved up to 41 point something. The people on placebo got a little bit worse. The difference between these, I know it's, it looks it's just uh, less than two points total, but still, that is a statistically significant score. That means, that means that it would not have been just a fluke that could have happened just by chance. Or at least there's, there's less than a, uh, that's, the, that's the likelihood that this would be a fluke occurring by chance, 0 0.008. And uh, this uses another scale, it's called the frontal assessment battery. It's a uh, test of behavior, and that showed a similar modest but statistically significant improvement. And these, um, this trial not only looked at how the patients were doing outwardly, they also looked at their brain with an imaging procedure called magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which can be done on a normal MRI machine, just with different software. Uh, this shows, this is a measure of uh, energy production by brain cells, and this is another measure of energy production, and uh, I won't go into all the statistics, but basically this shows improvements in both of those as well. So coenzyme Q10 and PSP, there was a 4% improvement in the PSP rating scale at six weeks, while without treatment we would expect a 4% worsening over that period of time and there was a corresponding improvement in these objective measures of brain energy production. We don't know if that improvement would have been maintained past six weeks. We don't know if the improvement would get even better with, with continued treatment. I mean, let's look at the bright side as well. And uh, there's this larger trial at the Leahy Clinic that will end this year. I should say that a large trial of coenzyme Q10 and Parkinson's disease proved ineffective. The good thing about CoQ10 is that it seems to have no important side effects. Other treatments for the atypical Parkinsonisms. Uh, deep brain stimulation, which is very useful in Parkinson's disease and dystonia and some other things, seems not to help PSP or CBD. Uh, same with pallidotomy, which is an earlier type of 
brain surgery, still occasionally used, does not help these diseases. Uh, there's a investigational use of deep brain stimulation of a part of the brain that is heavily involved in PSP and hasn't been uh, tried. It's also being tried in Parkinson's disease. Jury is still out with that. So if we discover mutations, genetic mutations, how does that translate into a treatment, as long as we're talking about experimental treatments? It could point to a previously unsuspected metabolic pathway. In other words, the gene, genes control enzymes, they code for proteins. You look to see what chain of biochemical events uses those proteins, those enzymes, and maybe you can modify that pathway in some way. Uh, that's uh, the second point as well. We may be able to put a, a normal version of the mutated gene into the patient's cells. This is much, much more difficult. Gene therapy, uh, the, uh, this, is, this science is in its infancy. But sometimes we can interfere with the action of a mutated gene. That's called the toxic gain of function. Maybe if we could prevent tau gene, if we could just shut down tau, that would prevent it from aggregating and causing mischief. Now you may say, well, don't we need tau in our brain cells? Well, yeah, we thought so, but when you create a mouse that has no tau, mouse seems perfectly happy. Now, of course, a mouse doesn't live as long as people do, but it's something to think about. Maybe, maybe we could sh shut down human tau at uh, age uh, 60, whatever, and the person would live the rest of their life not really knowing the difference much. It's possible. And could we implant cells engineered to perform the defective function? This is something that stem cells might be useful for, uh, and other types of implantable cells. The problem is that delivering drugs into the brain is difficult. Implanting cells requires a surgical procedure. And most of these diseases uh, have, would have multiple genes that would be contributing. And the multiple genes, there would be a different combination of genes in different people. So we're going to have to enter the, ear, the era of personalized medicine. I can easily foresee where in a few years, somebody with PSP will get a blood test. They, that will yield which genes, which of these mutations that have been identified are operating in their case, which, which variants they have, and then a special cocktail of gene therapies, stem cells, growth factors, whatever, can be, uh, antibodies can be administered that fixes their particular case in a custom-made way. And that is that. Thank you for listening.